Happy Saturday, everybody. This week, we have an episode coming up that is related to alchemy. And at first, I thought, uh, as I was researching it, that I would want to spend the first part of the episode talking a little bit about alchemy's overall history. But it turns out Sarah and Dublina did a whole episode on alchemy back in October of 2011 as one of their Halloween episodes that year. So we've pulled that one out of the archive for listeners who want to brush up on their alchemy knowledge. Enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Sarah Dowdy. And I'm Delaney Chakraborty. And today we're going to do something we rarely do. We're going to talk about chemistry a little bit and more generally the history of science, more specifically the history of alchemy. And I thought it might be fun to just maybe kick it off with our own experiences in chemistry. Mine are maybe not so illustrious. I don't think I've taken chemistry since 11th grade, and I may or may not have lit something on fire, maybe a French book. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I got a good grade, but I don't know if I'm if Why I'm did you get a good grade after you, Why did you get a good grade after you set something on fire? <laughs> maybe we shouldn't go into that too much. No, let's, let's leave that. My beginnings in chemistry were not illustrious either, although I did almost minor in chemistry. Oh, that's an interesting choice. Then. Yeah, I did. I was one class short of a chemistry minor, and then I chose to minor in German instead because I was also one class away from a German minor, and I thought that would be easier. Big mistake. <laughs> that was not easy. German was not easier than chemistry? Well, I don't know because I didn't take the final chemistry class that I would have taken, so maybe it would have been just as difficult. But reading and writing, once you get to the <laughs> higher levels and studying a foreign language, it's pretty difficult. I was actually one class short of a French major, so I know where you're coming from. I'm just curious, what was the last chemistry class? Organic Chemistry oh, 1, oh. which was kind of my downfall. I preferred inorganic chemistry to organic chemistry. That's so. understandable. I definitely remember people in college complaining about that one. So as we're going to find out today, chemistry and alchemy are pretty closely related. But we've seen alchemy pop up quite a bit lately in the podcast, most recently with the episode on John Dee, who, in addition to being an alchemist, was an astrologist and a spy and quite a few other things, too, as a talented man. But we've also been getting repeat listener suggestions for other alchemists like Nicolas Flamel and Paracelsus. So all of this really got me wondering, though, what exactly is alchemy? I mean, I know most people understand the chrysopia aspect, so that idea that base metals could be transmuted into gold. And many, many people have probably heard of the Philosopher's Stone through Harry Potter. Dublina, you're probably just learning that now. But aside from that, there's a really unsavory aspect about the whole science of, of alchemy, really. And I mean, that was what honestly got my attention with the subject in the first place. Yeah, it really calls to mind those dangerous Merlin types who slave over a hot fire, making pacts with the devil and combining alchemy with necromancy and magic, or those broken down old men who waste their intelligence and fortunes laboring to carry out hopeless experiments in dank dungeons. Those are the alchemy stereotypes we think of. Yeah, exactly. Or, I mean, worst of all, there are those, as we saw in the John Dee podcast, there are those charlatans who prey off people's desire for wealth and try to get wealth for themselves. Not that those aren't sometimes or that they weren't sometimes legitimate scenarios. Alchemy was often illegal. Charlatan alchemists were sometimes hanged in the 1590s in Prague, which was kind of the center of alchemy in Europe at the time, a mystery alchemist of Arabic origin showed up, gathered the richest merchants and bankers of the city together, and took 100 gold marks from each, promising to multiply them. He dropped the coins in a crucible filled with acids, mercury, lead, salt, eggshells, and horse dung, and set to fanning the fire. But before he could get the bellows going... There was a huge explosion, a cloud of fumes, and then, sure enough, a missing alchemist. With so that's just an all example. That gold. Yeah. So, I mean, there were these charlatans, but to only look at alchemy as a quacks pursuit or a charlatan's game really isn't fair. And it turns out that much of modern chemistry really does, as we mentioned, have roots in alchemy. It's just that the 
real scientists, I'm making air quotes right now, didn't always own up to it. So we decided it is time for a Halloween makeover for the science or the art of alchemy. Of course, though, something like alchemy is going to have really obscure beginnings. Yes, it is old. It's likely that it sprang up independently in different spots around the world, influenced by older arts like metallurgy, medicine, and almost always closely connected to religion, prophecy, or philosophy. It often had the same goal, too, no matter what part of the world we're talking about, transmutation for the better. So lead to gold, sick to healthy, earthly to heavenly. Chinese alchemy, for instance, was really very medicine-focused and influenced by Taoist beliefs. The idea that immortality could be obtainable went back as far as the 4th century BC. Yeah, so Chinese alchemists like Ko Hung, who lived in the 4th century, and Sun Tzu Miao, who lived in the 7th century, provided these elixirs of life. And I really love this detail, but the British historian Joseph Needham has even attempted to determine which Chinese emperors might have died from elixir poisoning, because if you are on this quest for uh, immortality and you're willing to drink just about anything to get it, it reasons that eventually uh, it might not work out in your favor. Indian alchemy was also more akin to what we might see as early medicine today, also really elixir-based, although in that case it was elixirs as cures for specific ailments less than elixirs as, as um, solutions for immortality. Yeah, so it really was kind of like a medical industry there. Western alchemy, however, took kind of a different route. Dating from Hellenistic Egypt, the earliest known Western alchemist is Sosimos of Panopolis, who lived around 300 AD. And his theory was that there was a magical substance that could transform things. He called it a tincture, and it had a few varieties. This tincture eventually became associated with the philosopher's stone or the, quote, stone that is not a stone. And I almost feel like that needs to be a scary voice, like the stone that was not a stone, is not a stone. Well, you should have told me ahead of time. <laughs> a Harry Potter kind of voice. Mm -hmm. but. Also around this time, Alexander the Great was said to have discovered the Emerald Tablet, which itself contained 13 cryptic axioms related to alchemy in the tomb of Hermes Thrice Great in Egypt. And alchemists really ran with this distinction, this connection to Hermes, and deemed themselves the sons of Hermes or Hermetic philosophers. And just one thing to keep in mind, and we're going to talk about this kind of a lot later, but the number one rule of this brotherhood was to keep it in the brotherhood. Don't go telling your secrets of alchemy to people who don't understand it. It was understood that if you devoted your lifetime to studying something like this, you could talk to your fellows, you could share experiments, maybe not even then, but it was all a very tight-knit, closed community. So Arab scholars further honed the alchemical texts in the 9th century and the 10th century. And from there, it eventually spread to Europe during the scholastic renaissance of the 12th century. And probably the most famous of the Arab alchemists was the Persian al-Razi, who is the director of the Baghdad Hospital and also really a well-known um, doctor and writer of medical texts by later medieval Europeans. He had a whole different name, whole different identity for that. But among alchemist, he was best known for his Book of Secrets, which was really straightforward, very clearly written, essentially a catalog of lab procedures concerned with transmuting gold and silver. So in an article for Arab Studies Quarterly, Gail Taylor writes that Al-Razi's methodologies, his attention to details like safety and repeatability, and his easy instructions make the Book of Secrets a proto-laboratory manual. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that line of thinking later. So, okay, we've got a sense of alchemy's progression through world history, but what was it all about besides elixirs and the Philosopher's Stone? What science background made the work alchemists did actually seem possible? Well, first, there's a fundamental confusion between elements and compounds that we need to go over really quick. Okay, so Aristotle had proposed the existence of five elements, and those were air, earth, fire, water, and quintessence. Then in the 13th century, a new text appeared by the mysterious alchemist Pseudo-Geber. 
While Jibra was often associated with 8th century Arab alchemist Jabir ibn Hayyan, Indiana University professor William Newman has ID'd Jibra as Paul of Taranto, a Franciscan monk. Newman has also traced a direct line of descent from al-Razi's Book of Secrets to Jibra's Sum of Perfection. In the Sum of Perfection, which subsequently became pretty much like the Bible for medieval European alchemists, Jeber honed down this idea of elements to include just two. All metals were varying combinations of mercury and sulfur. So kind of sounds like a recipe for gold making, don't you think? two ingredients, yeah. exactly. You just got to figure out the right ratio. So Paracelsus, who we mentioned in the beginning, was a Swiss physician who lived between 1493 and 1541. And he further developed the ideas of Jeber. He proposed that there were actually three basic substances, sulfur, mercury, and salt. But still, you know, you're working with a limited quantity of things and trying to make gold out of that. Because Paracelsus was a prominent physician, one who believed in observation as the best way of learning. A new type of medical alchemy really rose up around him and his style. And many doctors, alchemists, scientists worked in Prague in the court of Rudolf II, sort of striving to um, to do experiments based on Paracelsus's ideas. But alchemy wasn't all about mixing gold from scratch from these base elements. It eventually became about growing gold too. And I really think this is sort of the most interesting aspect of alchemy, at least for me. But we need some context for this as well, because why would anyone think that they could grow gold? So in the 16th century Europe, there was a belief that everything in the universe was alive and not just plants and animals, but minerals too. Like I don't know if you've ever grown your own crystals in a crystal kit when you were a kid. You can kind of understand where they might have been coming from. But according to a History Today article titled A New Light on Alchemy, people thought that minerals really grew from seeds that started out deep below the earth and matured gradually as they rose. So again, not too, too crazy because sometimes metal veins under the earth really do look tree-like in the way that they branch off into different veins. But the key here was the speed in which the seeds grew and developed and the materials that the minerals passed through. So for instance, lava was considered a lower form because it obviously rose through the ground rapidly and wasn't anything special, at least to the 16th century Europeans who were thinking about this. Gold, on the other hand, was believed to rise very, very slowly through the earth, taking its sweet time and ultimately ultimately coming out in the perfect form. So one idea was that the material that gold passed through on its way up from the low regions of the earth was the philosopher's stone, something that was around us but essentially unknown. So if you could figure out what the philosopher's stone was, you could make gold. And by extension, you'd have the key to perfection, something that could be applied to other worlds too, plants, animals, It would basically be the universal cure. So it wasn't all about making gold for the sake of having lots of money. It had that other aspect, that perfect desire for perfection aspect to it as well. And alchemist theories weren't dumb by any means. Lead ore does often contain silver. Silver ore does often contain gold. They saw these as things that were in process or ripening. And gold making wasn't the only goal of alchemy either. Other goals included the quest to find the universal solvent, the elixir of life or universal medicine, the ability to reincarnate plants and animals from their ashes, and also the ability to generate mini humans from semen and rotted horse dung. So that one sounds a little bit out there, but we should also mention that alchemy was also closely tied with Christian and Gnostic and Neoplatonic ideas, and you couldn't just perform the experiment. So you couldn't be the modern um, cool-headed chemist working in the lab. You had to be in the right mindset. You had to be completely in the game, essentially. And the History Today article we mentioned even suggested that that strong belief system might have come out of the frustration of failed experiments. If you just realize that you never could make gold, no matter how hard you tried, you might explain that as something you weren't quite with it. You weren't thinking the way you should have been. But just because experiments to turn lead or whatever base metal into gold did always end in frustration, sorry, it would have taken a nuclear reaction to make that work, guys. 
doesn't mean that alchemists didn't pick up a trick or two along the way. Alchemists did figure out things like distillation, acid-base reactions, precipitation from solution, and the refining of metals. They also created new alloys, conceived of atoms long before atomic theory, and repeated experiments, also making sure that they were repeatable. Kind of a basic requirement for lab experiments. Yeah, like the scientific method. They also began to shift in medicine away from plants toward minerals. In Discover magazine, Dr. Newman says that, quote, the goals of 18th century chemistry, namely to understand the material composition of things through analysis and synthesis, and to make useful products such as pharmaceuticals, pigments, porcelain, and various refined chemicals, were largely inherited from 16th and 17th century alchemists. So that makes us have to ask the question, if alchemy was science-based, albeit somewhat mystical, why did it develop such a bad reputation? Even John Dee, as we talked about in the, the recent podcast, who was living in the 16th and 17th centuries, suffered from his later dabbling in alchemy and conversations with angels. It really kind of ruined his career in a way. Later scientific geniuses like Isaac Newton spent 30 years working on alchemy, more than he did on physics and mathematics combined, but he tried to keep his interest secret. Again, according to Dr. Newman, who has extensively studied Newton's secret notebooks, he says, quote, alchemy became a danger to one's reputation when interest bled into enthusiasm. There were just a few fundamental problems with alchemy that were kind of hard to overcome. Yeah, one was that the quest for gold brought in swindlers. We mentioned charlatans in the beginning and how they were hanged for alchemy. Alchemists were also very secretive, thus alchemy's obscure texts and strange metaphors for chemicals or experiments like Babylonian dragons, green lions, toads that decompose and turn into ravens, Neptune's trident. We're going to talk a little more about that stuff, too. And finally, authorities didn't want anyone to make gold and devalue the currency. Lots of countries made it illegal to transmute metals, though they'd often secretly patronize their own alchemists to outwit the other guys. So (laughs) they, you know, on the assumption that you can do it, please don't. Please don't, but just in case, I'm going to have an insurance policy in my own alchemist. But despite the eventually obvious connection to chemistry, alchemy was still seen as a shameful beginning for the science. In 1831, Thomas Thompson called alchemy the, quote, rude and disgraceful beginnings of chemistry. Robert Boyle, who is a founder of modern chemistry, was embarrassed by his interest in alchemy. He called it a, quote, empty, vain, and deceitful study. So what do you do if the science that you want to pursue, that you want to study, is just mired in the bad imagery of magicians and astrologers and charlatans, you rebrand. You just create a whole new name and you keep doing the same old thing. So Boyle and other respectable types started calling themselves chemists, chemists spelled with a Y. And according to Lawrence Principe, who is a chemist and a historian of science at Johns Hopkins and a colleague of Dr. Newman's, over the next few decades after uh, Boyle was working in, in chemistry, these chemists distanced themselves almost entirely from alchemy. They had a new name and a new outlook on science. But it's not that they weren't doing the same work. Principe can't find written evidence that the new breed of chemists tried to refute the idea of metallic transmutation. Some were still looking to create gold from base metals as late as 1760. And in Johns Hopkins Magazine, Dr. Principe is quoted as saying, quote, Current scholarship is only now revealing how artificial and contrived the distinction between alchemy and chemistry really was. So it was seriously just a name change. Yeah, and Principe and Newman have both worked to recreate some of the old alchemist experiments. I think this is so interesting. It kind of reminded me of our old um, episode on historical beer, historical brews, and they've used recreations of 15th, 16th, 17th century labware and really gone to a lot of trouble to get the right kind of chemicals, um, the right minerals and things that would have been available at the time. And the experiments, the old alchemy experiments, have cool names like the Star of Regulus of Antimony or the Net. The question, though, is do they work? Obviously, the ones that are supposed to turn a base metal into gold do not end up working. But some of them really do show interesting uh, kind of 
chemical experiments. One recreated experiment called the Tree of Diana uh, is described by Newman as sounding like this, quote, if you immerse a solid amalgam of silver and mercury in nitric acid with dissolved silver and mercury, you produce tiny twig-like branches of solid silver. So it really does look kind of like a tree, and you can get that idea that minerals are something that grow from seeds and and not closer to the way we understand them today. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 